So we'll get started. Let's take, take a moment, quick prayer, and then we'll get going. <clears throat> Dear Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the word. We uh, ask for concentration and uh, so we can better understand your plan and grow spiritually and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we left off with 2 Corinthians 12, 10. And I'll read it real quick. It says, Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And we left off on that last, that last phrase there. And um, the, the verb here, the word weakness is kind of like the word we already saw, except it's a verb. So this is actually going through physically, going through the, you know, the debilitating illness or the sickness or disease or the lack of confidence. Same word, but the verbal form, okay? But just before the word weak, there Paul uses a little conjunction that use, is used to refer to many instances, and it's usually translated whenever. I know here it uses when, but some of your translations may say whenever. And all that means is, well, the word itself means, um, he's saying whenever the suffering occurs, that I'm going through, or whatever weakness I'm going through, uh, this applies. In other words, every single time, whenever. That's why I like the verb whenever, or the word whenever as a translation, because it kind of tells you, okay, it doesn't matter how it comes at you, or when it comes at you, or what you're doing in the midst. He's just saying whenever. He's leaving it at that. And then it says, I am. There's your verb of being. I am strong. The word strong here means what is made possible because of the power, ability exerted by the subject. Wow, doesn't that sound interesting? See, this is what Paul is talking about when he's referring to utilizing the power of God in his life. He's saying that because of the power and ability that God has through me, that he can be strong. That's how he can be strong in the midst of weakness. And then you've got a present tense both on weak and on strong. And all that tells me is these things are occurring simultaneously, same time. During the weakness, you can have strength. All happening at the same time. So you can notice something that there's an exchange process here. There's a voluntary exchange of your power for God's power that's happening here. And that's why I kept saying earlier, you can either experience the pain and suffering or you have another option. You can exchange, have that exchange process of God's power in the midst of the weakness. So we've got to start making the suffering um, beneficial on ourselves. And I would say even easier. And I was reminded of, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Um, you know, there's a lot in that verse that I think encompasses and helps us in the midst of suffering. It's not just about the circumstance or the suffering. It's about rooted in a dedication and a love that includes all these things. Your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. That is you. That's the entire you. That you have no more to give if you don't have those. So we can also see the word here that Paul used for contentment. We can see it in Paul's letter to Timothy. 
And the reason why I want us to hear this is because many times our expectations of what we should or shouldn't have or what we should be experiencing or shouldn't be experiencing are actually not rooted in reality. They're not, they have really no basis for what God is trying to do through us, through the circumstances of what our view of them really is. So, we, you know, we can easily get caught up in comparing our lives to other people's lives. And that's why all I wanted to mention on that because at that point, then we're trying to justify our circumstances of what we should or shouldn't have in suffering. But that is not necessarily attached to the word. It's not attached to reality. It's not attached to truth. It's not attached to what's really happening. Our comparison and our you know, view of what it is is most of the time inaccurate, especially if you apply it to this right here, a growing believer or even a believer getting disciplined. There's always a reason and it's always appropriate. We could say that. Now, now all the details under that I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it's always appropriate. And it doesn't just happen to you by accident, and it's not a mistake. So let's look at the, and I actually have that slide. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Remember, I wanted to give us some expectations. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. That's our word. Actually, no, that's not our word. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. There's our word. Content. You got you to gotta say what an attitude. What an attitude to have. How many of us can be content in food? The actual word for content is covering, which includes, can include clothes or shelter, but it's a covering. He's saying he's content in these things. Sometimes you have to really bring yourself back down to reality. And this is one of those verses that brings us back to reality. It brings us back to the basics that God is providing for us in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Doesn't matter in whatever. And that's really what we can expect and be thankful for. That God will provide what is needed in the suffering, in the circumstance. Paul's saying, I'm content with food and clothes and covering. So, you know, when you read that, you got to ask yourself, you know, it's easy to become complacent or unthankful when you have things like we have in the United States. It's very easy to get complacent. You know, the thought doesn't even cross your mind that you, you have a house. You've got running hot water and cold water. You have plumbing. You have an AC. AC. <coughs> You've got heaters. You've got insulation, sheetrock, shingles, electricity to run all these things. And then you've got clothes, food, shelter. How about transportation? Everybody has transportation. That's just a thing that comes with it. And you know, many times we take it for granted that gas is in the pump. All these things that we have, and Paul's saying, I'm content with food and covering. That's it. This is a soul issue right here. We have all these things, and we get caught up in what we think we might be content with. We need to bring it back to the spiritual aspect of this, and where... We are really content in what makes us content. And you've got to rely on God in that situation. Because you can get to the point where you do 
and joy and get used to certain things, but don't rely on those things for your contentment because they can disappear just as easy as God has given them. And we all, you know, kind of need to be reminded of that. And here we are stressed out about things in life that have nothing to do with the grace benefits that God is providing. We just expect a lot of things. We just expect our circumstances to be maybe better, whatever our better is, right? We expect these things. But that is not God's purposes. He doesn't want you to go and spend time not being tested. There's no point. You've got to be formed. You've got to be molded. You've got to be able to glorify him. And if he leaves you in a position where you're not doing that, but you may be having better circumstances, which one's better? That's the decision Paul was trying to make. I'm content with this. This is where I am in my soul. So we need to lower our expectations maybe just a little bit of what we feel like we should have or shouldn't have when it comes to your physical circumstance, especially if you're growing spiritually. Be thankful for what God is doing in your life with what you have, with what he's given you. So up to this point, we have joy, contentment, endurance as benefits, and then we have being able to take part in God's power so all these are benefits within suffering that we've seen this far. Then we have another verse, chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, is actually Paul's call to action to the Corinthians. He, he does this by explaining his own personal experience in adversity, which I think is an example for us to see, uh, because as Paul's obviously an example to us. He's been teaching preaching about his circumstances, and it's all the Word of God, right? So 2 Corinthians 6, 4, and I don't have that slide. It says, But in everything commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses. Okay, we're good there. Same kind of language Paul's using. Kind of what we came from. Maybe a little nuance of the words, but you can see it's, um, not easy times here. Sounds like just a lot like what we were discussing earlier. So he's kind of keeping it general. You notice the words he, he's using? In much endurance, affliction, hardships, and distresses. So then he ramps it up in intensity in verse 5. So everybody's okay with the first part. And then he says, in beatings, in imprisonments, in disorder or confusion in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger. Okay, now we're starting to drop off. Not everybody's on board with all this because you haven't experienced all this. Probably we've, a lot of us have been beat, but probably not in this way that Paul is referring to being beat. Uh, maybe you've been in prison, but you haven't had the type of prison that Paul's been in. Um, you know, these guys get AC, they get three meals a day, they get to play time, recess, they get to, if they want to sit and watch TV all day, they can, believe it or not, on your dime. Uh, they have rights nowadays. There was no rights in Paul's day. He was a prisoner, and a prisoner doesn't expect anything but to be behind the bars and maybe a you know, keep you alive, I would think. Um, most of us have experienced sleeplessness. You're probably thinking, I just did. But not in the way Paul is referring to it. He actually used this word one more time. And it was in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Let me read to you what he said. He says, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. We can't, can't compare to that. 
So pretty sure none of us can top Paul's experiences as far as suffering goes. And then in verse 6, he makes another transition in what he's talking about to the positive things. He goes to the positive things now. He says in purity, that's holiness, in knowledge, in patience. And remember, patience is one of those fruits of the Spirit. Remaining tranquil while waiting an outcome. That's that endurance. In kindness, this is an uprightness in one's relationship with others. Being a benefit in, relation, in relationships. And then he says, it sounds like he's getting more into the, the mandatory items. In the Holy Spirit, that was 2 Corinthians 11. Sorry. 2 Corinthians 6. 6. And then he says, in, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God. And then he says, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. So it almost sounds like he's getting to the more critical things if we're going to experience any of these other things, the great things that he talked about just before this. So what is critical? He says the Holy Spirit, love, the word of truth, and then the power of God. And we've all kind of talked about those things, maybe not all in one verse, but think about how critical they are in suffering. The Holy Spirit is a given. We've got to have that, the filling. Love. You don't often think about love as a, a problem solver when you think about suffering. But love is a problem solver. Because love is what drives your motivation to continue doing what you're doing and to have a positive attitude about it. It's not just for us. It's for other people. It's not just a mission just designed specifically for you. It also includes other people. And part of the process means that takes love. Sometimes a lot of love. Then think about how we defeat darkness, evil, unrighteousness. Well, what Paul mentions right here with weapons of righteousness. This has to do with the God's righteousness. Isn't that neat? This is how we think. This is our weapons. With the righteousness of God. His word, his truth are your weapons. That's your defense. And that comes out in your obvious actions with other people. It doesn't have to manifest itself physically. But it got, this is what guides your life. The righteousness of God. And in other words, there's no other better weapon to have when it comes to the spiritual realm. It's what God gives us. The word weapons here is actually plural. So you've got multiple weapons of righteousness. And it means an instrument designed to make ready for military engagement. That sounds pretty serious. Especially with the things you're up against. This is what you've been given. Verse 8, by glory and dishonor, Paul continues, by evil report and good report. Now, as I get into this next part, just think about as you go through suffering, think about a few things. Think about how other people see this, what's, what you're going through. Think about the physical versus the spiritual as I talk about these things, because this is what Paul, he's going to give you one example and then give you the complete opposite. Because what you see is not always what you get. And that's what he's referring to here. Regarded as deceivers and yet true. You will no doubt face opposition to truth. And one of the enemy's offensive strategies is to what? Deceive. Tell lies. What you think is not true. And what you're doing is not right. What you believe in is wrong. 
your standards are not right and they're not accepted. That's what they are going to push the blanket and cover you up with. So that's why he says, as regarded as deceivers, but is that the reality? Yet true. No, it's not. You've seen that today. Verse 9, as unknown yet well known. No one said you have to be known on this earth to be well known in heaven. And to have great things according to who knows you. And the only person that matters that knows us and what we're doing and that really counts is God himself. So an unknown believer can have the greatest impact on this earth. Being known has nothing to do with it. And then he says, as dying, yet behold, we live. As punished, yet not put to death. And this is kind of getting into our area as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. See the difference, the, the, the contrast in these words? It's just you look at certain things and this is the interpretation you will get from 95% of the people. But it's not really what's happening. It's not having nothing yet having everything. So I'm hoping that you can hear what's really happening between the physical comparison and, and what's actually true spiritually in, in what we have as believers in Jesus Christ as we move through these things. Because not only will people try to tell you otherwise, the circumstances will try to talk you out of what's really happening in your life in the suffering. It will, and then you'll try to talk yourself out of it. You'll convince yourself that it is sorrowful, or you are poor, or you, are, you do have nothing. Those are the kind of thoughts that we get if we get caught up in the convincing process of the lie. But that's not really what's happening. It's not. As Paul experiences all these physical sufferings, at the same time, he experiences this physical or the spiritual blessings and riches in Christ and physical blessings for that matter. So, you know, as we move through this life, we may not have a physical abundance, but you're an application away from taking it in stride, according to this verse. Because of the truth that underlies what's happening in your life. What is really happening, what at, at its core, are you really deprived? No. You're actually being paid very close attention. God realizes where you're at in your life and at what time you're there and who the people are around you. And he wants you to tap into what's really happening, not what's not happening. Not what we sometimes convince ourselves that is happening. Not that. And all this is, is just an understanding of, of, of what's there, of the benefits. When we understand that these advantages are better, then we can concentrate on them. Then we know instead of the disadvantages. Because as you well know, focusing on the disadvantages of suffering is not accurate. It is not accurate at all. It's not. Even though sometimes we want it to be, it's not accurate. It's not based on truth and it's not applying the word. So and then Paul tells the Corinthians if they, you know, if they're not moving in this direction, if they're not viewing these things as they should, he tells them what's holding them back. Verse 11, it says, Our mouth has spoken freely to you. O Corinthians, our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. The word restrained here means to be in a circumstance that seems to offer no way out. That's where we go. 
That's where we take things when we look at our circuit. There's no way out. There's no solution. It's all doom and gloom. It's all negative. That's not reality. How many times do we think there's no solution? Or we can't see the positive outcome. And we have these kinds of thoughts. Never justified according to God's word. According to actually when you entered in that position you're in now at a believer in, as a believer in Jesus Christ. These things aren't really appropriate. I mean, can you imagine setting someone up for success and then them rejecting every single bit of it, and on top of that, complaining from what they don't have, but you have it sitting right there waiting to use it? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about going through the things of life and looking at them with the wrong attitude, with the wrong thought process. Just this. We've been given everything. So, you have to ask yourself, well... What's restraining them? It says in your own affections. So it sounds like it's the individual that's restraining themselves. This is the word here is saying what's close to your heart. How do you really think about suffering? Your affection. What do you really gravitate to more? The divine solution or your own solutions? That's the seat of your understanding and your passion and your drive in the spiritual life. This is how you really feel. This is the decisions you really make. Do you want to make a difference? I, I know I do. I want to make the right decision. I can't guarantee you that I will 100% of the time, and I don't think you can either. But we want to. Most people don't even know how or they don't care to. We don't want to be in that position. But do you see how all this is, is referring back to there has to be a change in your thought process. We've got to think with the truth because until the lesson is learned and the truth is discovered that there's a better way, there's a better solution, we, can't, we, we won't do this. This, is, this cannot be real in our lives unless we know because you will naturally go for the wrong bait every single time. Because we don't know. And if we don't know, we go for the wrong direction, look at the circumstances, and that's it. That is it. And then these, or actually, and then part of what we do is, is to blame everything else but ourselves. It's funny how Paul mentions this is us holding ourselves back. And when we get to the, the issue where nothing's changing, nothing's happening, we start to point fingers. We start to, he says, no, this is your own affection. But we say, you know, it's this, this, and this, and this. Paul says, nah, you're the hold up. Has everything to do with us if we're not thinking this way. So these next verses I wanted to look at quickly is these refer to suffering for blessing under some kind of unreasonable authority. And it basically says that instead of reacting that we should still be obedient. Still be obedient. 1 Peter 2.19 It says, For this finds favor. Here we go. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. So this is what finds favor with God. If you bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Unjustly, not even justified. Remember, you didn't do anything wrong. For the sake of a conscience towards God. So that means your awareness of God, which is you have a healthy fear of the Lord and therefore make decisions in accordance with his plan. So is your, you know, are you healthy in that area? I think we should have a fear, not in a sinful aspect, but in a, in a way that is respectful to who God is and what he is capable of.
If you think about him, then you will do what? Bear up under sorrows. That's what the verse is saying. It's a thought process. Bear up under sorrows. This means to bear up under trouble or difficulty, submit to, to endure. And I like this, to bear something for the sake of another. We're always taking someone else into account when it comes to you growing spiritually. Always. And if there's no one around you, if you're not in any circumstances to be in or no people test right now, you always take in Jesus Christ. Always. If we don't do this, if we don't take this into account, what do we do when things go sideways as far as unjust treatment goes? We react. We react. We want payback. We want, we want to see, we seek justice, and I'm going to be the one that gets the justice done, right? They said so and so about me. Well, I'm going to show them. That's what we naturally gravitate to. But that's not what the plan of God, that's not what this is saying that is satisfying or what is desirable here. What it's saying is that to endure while looking to him for solutions. That, that's the solution we're referring to in any kind of suffering. To endure the suffering throughout the suffering looking to him for solutions. Does that get hard and difficult? Does it get distracting because of what you're in? Yes. But it doesn't mean that we can't do it at all we can still look to him for solutions. We can. Remember, it's worth it. We talked about that. It's worth it. We already know that it outweighs the other side. It's worth it. The value of this decision outweighs all others you can make. It's the top choice in the mature believer's mind, or it should be. It should be. As one who is treated unjust, unjustly, yet spiritually prospering and pleasing to God. Or suffering and yet pleasing to God. Suffering yet pleasing. Doesn't that kind of sound like the same language we just heard? Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Poor yet making rich. Having nothing yet possessing all things. Suffering and yet pleasing and glorifying within those circumstances. Same type of idea here. Same thing is happening. Always a larger purpose. Always a much greater value in the spiritual that we have to understand so we can be conscious and make the decisions in the right direction. And then he says for verse 20 says, For what credit is there? If when you sin, now listen to the logic here. For what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Question mark. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure, this finds favor with God. That's what we've been talking about. See, you can suffer just to suffer, and you can suffer with a purpose. Take your pick. I would prefer that you suffer with a purpose. That's the point of any church, that you suffer with a purpose. Making right decisions in the midst of suffering is all that counts for us. Notice it doesn't include moaning and groaning. I just said making right decisions. Making right decisions. God knows the de God knows how bad it hurts. He does. I swear. Sometimes you know He can't know how bad this hurts. He does. He knows, and you have to take that into your calculation as well, because He knows better than we do. Yes, it does. It's not comfortable, but all He requires is what to look to Him for solutions. To look to him. This finds favor with God. And if you're asking yourself, well, why do we have to do this? 
Well, verse 21 answers that. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps. That's a bold statement, verse. You've been called. You've been called. It's a calling. God has called you to do just what you are doing, and you wouldn't want to be doing anything else, I swear. You wouldn't want to be doing anything else, even though we might think we do or want to. This is what you're called to do. It's a calling. It's, it's, a, it's your destiny, we could say. You're living the spiritual life. You're glorifying God. And we will all be able to look and talk and rejoice one day without a sin nature and look back on this and say, this is why we did what we did because look at what we're looking at now. Look at the responsibility that Christ has given us to rule with him in the millennial kingdom. Not everyone is going to have these things. We need to make decisions to be in that position, to have the awards that the Bible talks about. You know, do we... You go through life wanting various things, but we've got to start thinking about the eternal aspect of these. We've been called with a purpose. And notice what the driving factor is. For, well, first you've been called, and next because Christ has also suffered for you. This isn't even referring to an individ- or a collective basis anymore. Yes, he died for the world, but now it's bringing it down to our level. It says you, individually, each and every one of us. There's a plan, there's a purpose, and we've got to stay on track. And we have an example. We've got it. He left us an example to follow in his footsteps. So don't be surprised if the suffering comes your way. Don't be surprised if adversity hits. But just know, be able to to distinguish. Is it suffering? Is God trying to give you some endurance to continue on, to move forward, for these things to get easier? Because I can guarantee you, it will get easier. Suffering stays the same. It can only hurt so much. And then you die. But what keeps getting more and more and more is the maturing process in your soul. How much power do you want to tap into? Do you want it all or do you want none? Because that's what we're referring to here. God wants to give it all to us, but we have to be able to accept it. So don't be surprised when it comes. Uh, We we can see that in 1 Peter 4. It says, do not be surprised. It says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing. As though some strange thing were happening to you. Don't don't be surprised. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and God rest on you. That's what this is all about, really. It's not about what people think. It's not even about what we think. It's about what is the truth and reality of what's happening within the circumstance of our life. So, with that being said, we'll pick up on Wednesday. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the the ability ability to rejoice in the midst of suffering. We know this is not something that's humanly possible, but we know all things are possible through Christ. And we thank you for that. Thank you for tapping into this uh, power that you offer us in your word. And we just pray that we can not only uh, apply this, but have that steadfastness to run to it, run to application in a hurry so we can... Uh, apply it as soon as possible and live it. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.